Father, we thank you for your manifestation of your presence this evening. We thank you and we worship you for it. God, we praise you and magnify your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to take a few moments tonight and share something with you that the Lord spoke out to me this afternoon in my prayer time. Let's look again at our scripture in the fourth this message is very close to my heart, saith God, because this is the way my kingdom operates, and if my people will learn this and walk in it, they'll never fail. Praise the Lord. That's what I said in tongues. In the fourth chapter of the book of Mark, we can begin reading in the 14th verse, The sower soweth the word, these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. When they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended." These are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. These are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirty, some sixty, and some a hundred. Praise God. Now, we have learned several things about this. We found out that the hundredfold return is God's great way and guarantee of multiplying seed sown. One hundredfold is the guarantee of the covenant that we have. Philippians 4.15, the apostle Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, and he said, No other church has communicated with me except you, in giving and receiving. He didn't just say giving only, but giving and receiving. Receiving is an equal part of giving, just as much as harvest is an equal part of planting. You're not a good farmer if all you know how to do is plant. If you don't know how to harvest, in fact, you're missing the most important part. What's the use of planting if you don't harvest? And I want to tell you folks something, whether it's money or whether it's in any other area of your life, Jesus said the whole kingdom of God is compared to the planting and the harvest principle. And Satan's not going to give you any trouble as long as you're giving and not receiving. He could care less. If you're not receiving, you're not going to give enough to ever hurt him any. It's when you begin to receive and the thing starts multiplying and it starts growing. That's when you go to getting dangerous to him and that's when he'll attack you. And that's when he'll call you on the telephone and tell you you're crazy for believing that. And that's when you can folks get disturbed at you. And that's when preachers get disturbed about it. Preachers get more disturbed than anybody. My dad was telling me about a meeting here the other night. Preachers are the ones that get disturbed more than anybody, but I'll tell you what, they're also the ones that know a good deal when they see it. And you get them turned on to the Word, and they'll be the first ones in it. Brother Savell had a meeting in Fort Worth, Texas. Charles Capps was there, and Happy Caldwell was there, and, and several other men of God were there preaching the gospel. And the last night, the Spirit of God began to move and, and caused the people to receive an offering to help uh, that church pay off the property that they needed. They'd been leasing a place where they'd been having church and they outgrown the thing. Man, I mean, they got people, you know, in every corner. And so they believe in God for the property and they found the property and, and, and laid claim to it, praise God, and spoke the Word of God to it. And the man that owned it said, it's yours, praise the Lord. And they believe in God for it, see. And, and God led them to receive an offering. So they said, we're going to receive an offering for the down payment of the thing so we can lock the thing up. Well, it was a funny thing. Those faith men, those preachers that is preaching the Word, they're the ones that jumped in and started off the giving. And they were the ones that started giving the big money. You know, two, three, four, five thousand dollars. 
My dad said, now, wait a minute. Look here now. <laughs> he said, you know, when I was out in the business world, and he said, when the, when, the, when, the, when the guys that were running the company came down and decided it was time to make investment in this thing, we knew it was a good deal because they knew how it worked and they knew it was going to make money. And when the boss of the thing goes to investing, you better get in it. He said, I'm putting a $1,000 in this thing. They didn't get the down payment. They paid off the property. Well, now, see, when men that know how to receive get involved in it, I happen to know every one of those preachers and every one of them within five years ago was all broke. Every one of them five years ago was broke. I don't mean kind of out of shape. They were broke. <laughs> Amen. Well, praise God, I'm telling you, you get a bunch of preachers turned on to the Word and get them moving in line with God... And they'll shake heaven and earth. Why? Because they know it works. I know this works. Man, I'm not standing up here talking to you about something I'm wondering about. I know it works. I'm living in this 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Praise God. The suit on my back came from what I'm telling you right now. I got tickled the other day. The man I bought this suit from is a friend of mine there in Fort Worth back there years ago. When I first started learning how to believe God, and I'd been sowing seeds, just giving a dollar or two here and there, just every dollar I'd get my hands on it and give it away. I didn't have any clothes. I used to weigh 260 some odd pounds. I was bigger then in the waist than I am now in the shoulders. And, and I didn't have any clothes. All my clothes are just, well, you can imagine. You go from a size 48 down to a 42, something got to give. And so what I had to give was all those clothes. I gave them all away, you know. And I didn't have any. And this man in that clothing store, he and I were laughing about it. My, my dad and I were in there the other day. I had gone in there and I had, God had blessed me and I had this $125 in my hand, praise God, and I got it believing God. I didn't ask anybody for it. I didn't take up an offering for it. I didn't tell anybody I was out of clothes. And where I was preaching, the people were staying away in multitudes. Nobody cared a thing in the world about what I was saying except Gloria. But I believed God and used my seed-planted faith in my confession of my mouth. And I had finally come up with that $125, brother, and I knew where that suit was. And I went down there to get it. I knew what rack it is hanging on. I'd walked in there and rubbed it two or three times. I knew right where it was. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's almost the same color as what I have on right now. And I walked in there, and I was asking Jack the other day, I said, Jack, you remember that. I said, I walked, and I was giving him my testimony, see. And I said, and I told him what I had been doing. I walked in there, and I paid him. Uh, uh, excuse me. I was ready to pay him. I had tried the suit on. They'd marked it up for me, you know. And so I walked back in there in the, in the dressing room and took it off and brought it back out there, you know, after they marked it all up and everything and, and, and going to do the alterations on it and I was going to pay him. And I piled it up there, you know, on the, on the counter and handed him my money. He said, you don't owe me anything. I said, what? No, he said, while you was in the dressing room, in there, somebody come in here and paid for that. <laughs> well, I was talking to him about it the other day. Now, see, that's been 12 years ago. I said, Jack, do you remember that? He grinned real big and he said, yeah, I do. And said, he did it, pointing to my daddy. <laughs> I, didn't know, I didn't know he did it. He paid for that while I was in that dressing room and left and told Jack not to tell and the reason Jack told me about it is because that morning, the other morning, when we went over there to Jack's store, I bought Daddy a suit. <laughs> See? And Jack, it really got to Jack. He, he, it, it really thrilled him because he was remembering that. And I, and I got thinking about that suit, but I didn't know my dad's one who bought it. All I knew was, dear God, this thing works. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Now, giving and receiving. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to have to read that again because 
That is so important. Second Corinthians chapter 9. Jesus said, The sower soweth the word, seed being sown. He said, The whole kingdom of God is this if a man plants a seed into the ground. Verse 6. This I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. Every man, according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. As it is written, He hath dispersed abroad, He hath given to the poor, His righteousness remaineth forever. Now, he that ministereth seed to the sower, I want you to underline that right there. He that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, underline that, and multiply your seed sown. God is the multiplier. Now, God wanted me to show you tonight how to start from scratch without any seed says here, He's the provider of seed sown and bread for your food and the multiplier of your seed sown. Are you listening now? I'm going to show you how to start from scratch. Start with nothing but God's Word and go from there. God is the multiplier. Let me remind you of something again now. The hundredfold return is the rate of His guaranteed rate of multiplication. That's what He's guaranteed. He'll multiply at a hundredfold. Some didn't get but 30, some 60, and some 100. Some didn't get any. Turn with me to, the, to Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. Why didn't some get any? Because Satan came immediately to take out the word which is sown, and they let him have it. Now, look what Jesus said here in the 10th chapter of Mark. A rich young ruler incident, and Peter came up after the rich young ruler left off, and Jesus said, you know how hard it is for rich people to enter into the kingdom of heaven? He said, how can anybody be saved? Jesus said, with men it's impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Well, thank God we're not without God. 29th verse, Verily I say unto you, there's no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake in the Gospels. But he shall receive a hundredfold now, in this time, or in this lifetime, another translation said. Another translation says, in this age, houses, brethren, sisters, mother, children, and lands, with persecutions. That's the affliction, persecutions. Cares of this world, deceitfulness, riches, and lusts of other things entering in that Jesus talked about over there in the fourth chapter. And in the world to come eternal life, many that are first shall be last and the last first. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means there's a lot of people going to jump out on this and start planting, and they'll start planting first and be the last to ever reap a harvest. And there's going to be some of them that are the last ones to come along and plant a harvest, and they're going to be the first ones to reap. Why? Why is that so? Because Jesus said Satan would come immediately to take the word out which was sown. Now, you can make your choice whether you're going to be among the first or among the last. Are you just going to hang around and let him rob you out of your crop and never receive and never do anything about it? I've had people come to me and tell me this. Why, well, Brother Copeland, I've been tithing for years and I never got anything back. I mean, I never got any return. Isn't that right? I mean, you know people have done it. I did it for a long time. Well, it's not God's fault. Don't blame Him with it because there's as much to receiving as there is to giving. You can't harvest without planting, but you cannot... You, you, <laughs> you're not going to do you any good to plant if you don't harvest. Now, God multiplying the seed is God using His supernatural power, His divine power. That's God that does that. 
Don't you know in another place in the Bible it said, Some plant and some water. But God giveth the increase. Huh? Same principle in operation, isn't it? Well, at what rate does He plan to give the increase? Hundredfold. He's the one that has planned all the time to use His supernatural power to do that. All right. What does the Bible say about our partaking of His divine power? How do you partake of the divine nature of God? The Word says very plainly, Peter wrote this in a letter and said this, Second Peter. In fact, you ought to read through the whole first two chapters to get this. Read all the way around all of it and get the whole thing. But he said, well, let's just turn over there and read it now. I can quote it to you, but you need to read it out of your Bible. Second Peter. Let's look in the first chapter. Verse 3, according as His divine power, His divine power hath given unto us all things, say that, all things that pertain unto life and godliness, how? Through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us. There has been given unto us. I like to make that first person. There has been given unto me. If it's been given unto us, then it's been given unto me. So to make it strike your thinking, I'm going to read it that way. There has been given unto me great exceeding great and precious promises. Now listen. That by these ye may be partakers of the divine nature. Oh, glory to God. How are you partakers of the divine nature of God? Through the exceeding precious promises of God. And having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. You can escape any corruption. You can escape sickness and disease. You can escape it, thank God, because you can take God's Word and plant that Word and get a hundredfold return on that Word. And through that divine nature, God will multiply the seed of that Word that you plant in your heart and it will grow into a huge, huge tree of healing that you can crawl up in the shadow of, praise God. Amen? How? Through the exceeding great and precious promises. Okay. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah. Chapter 55. Verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts higher than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Did you get that line? That's what we were hunting, wasn't it? How to get the seed and the bread. All right. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. His word will provide the seed for the sower and bread for the eater. See, he said, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. That didn't mean he's saying, and you got to stay dumb too. No, he said, as the rain comes down. Now, listen to what he's saying. He's comparing this to the rain. As the rain comes down and waters the earth and causes seed to the sower and bread for the eater, so shall my word be. 
In other words, His Word has come down to the earth. His Word, just like the rain, has come to do that, to provide seed for the sower and bread for the eater. And listen to what he said. Glory to God. It shall not return unto me void. It shall not return unto me. It shall not return unto me void. It will not return unto me void. It will not return unto me void. His Word, obviously, is going to have to return to Him. But it won't return to Him void. Well, it's not going to just bounce off of the earth. How does His Word return to Him? When you go to the Word of God, He said right here that it shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. You take God's Word and you feed it into your spirit by taking the thought of that Word and saying it, taking that Word and saying it, taking that Word and saying it over and over and over and over and over and over and over. By His stripes I'm healed. Himself bore my sicknesses and carried my diseases. Oh, thank God Jesus is my healer. Oh, glory to God, surely He has borne my griefs and carried my sorrows, sicknesses and diseases. Oh, thank God I'm the healed. Oh, thank God. And just, just begin to say it. Take the Word and say it. Take the Word and say it. Jesus said in the sixth chapter of Matthew, Why take ye the thought saying? Take it and say it. 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 Over and over and over and over and over. I know it gets monotonous. What difference does that make? So do those insulin shots. And say it, 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 and say it. And all of a sudden, you'll find yourself getting full of that. Something happens. I can't explain it. I can't say it in words. Some of you are grinning at me. You've experienced it. Something happens when you feed night and day on the Word. In the Proverbs, Solomon wrote it like this and said, My son, attend to my word. Incline thine ear unto my saying. Let them not depart from thine eyes and keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life to those that find them and they are help to their flesh. Something happens down in there. You get full of it. Somebody just look at you funny and it will roll out your mouth before you have time to stop it. Thank God I'm healed in the name of Jesus. Then you think, how come he say that? Well, you've been doing that all the time. You're the one been standing around saying, Well, I guess I'll get the flu. Ha, 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 ha. Then you think, Why don't I say that? Because that's what you've been feeding on. You take the thought and say it. Take the thought and say it. I got in my little back bedroom there in that little shack we were living in in Tulsa, Oklahoma, right down there by the Arkansas Riverbed. And I got back in that back bedroom and I caught, I caught sight, just a bare glimpse of this principle. And I started saying it. My God meets my needs according to His riches and glory. My God meets my needs according to His riches and glory. My needs are met. 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 Hallelujah. My God meets my needs according to His riches and glory. My needs are met. 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 Ah, my needs are met. 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 Glory to His riches and glory. Oh, glory to God. I'm not the needy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My needs. Are met, my needs are met, my needs are met, my needs are met, my needs are met. And I did that over and over and over and over and over and over, day after day after day after day after day after day. And my mind said, You're the dumbest thing I ever heard in my life. Your needs are not met. You haven't got any clothes. Your, your wife and family just barely got enough to eat. You owe everybody between here and the, the Texas border. I said, I don't care. The word said, my needs are met, 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 my needs are met. Well, a few days somebody asked me and say, Well, how's he going? I'd say, Well, my needs are met in the name of Jesus. And they couldn't understand how come I was dressing like that if my needs is met. I don't care what they think. But there came a time when there was more of that in me than there was my circumstances. 
And it still is. But I, I, I finally got to a place and I went to God. I said, now look here. Your word's not going to return to me void. And I want to know where I stand in this, in this need met business. I know my needs are met according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now I'm expecting a manifestation of it. Now you know he said he will provide the seed for the sower. Things started happening. He started showing me things I could give that I'd overlooked. He started showing me principles about walking in the laws of prosperity. I was up in a little old town in Hereford, Texas, and he said, I want you to preach on tithing. I said, I don't even know how. What do you mean, preach on it? I don't know anything about it. He said, I want you to preach on tithing. I said, I told you I don't know anything about it. He said, I want you to preach on tithing. I said, I told you, I don't know anything about it. I went on and prayed there a little while, and the Lord said, I want you to teach on tithing. Like, Boy, he's stubborn. Not that you. No, he's not stubborn. He's right. <laughs> he doesn't have to be stubborn. He's right. He said, I want you to preach on tithing. I said, I don't know anything about it. He said, I want you to teach on tithing. I said, well, All right. <laughs> I'll teach on it, but you'll have to teach me something about it. He said, well, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> now, after I'd been confessing, my need you met, my need you met, my need you met, over and over and over like that for days and days and days and days, that's when he started dealing with me and started teaching me the laws of prosperity. He didn't start teaching me the laws of prosperity just because I went in there and bawled and squalled half the day and cried and kicked because I was so deep in debt. He started it because I started pouring His Word out, and His Word did not return void. And it prospered in the thing whereunto He sent it. And it started working in there. And the Spirit of God started working. And the angels of God started working. And people started coming around. And people started doing things. And people started giving me things. People got to where they run me down and give me something. I was in the Oral Roberts meetings, and he started talking about his partnership program one afternoon. I didn't have not one dime. Not a dime. Dying. I wanted to be a partner with that ministry so bad I could have screamed. Didn't have a dime. I'm standing here about mad. God, I want in on that partner program bad. Ten dollars a lousy month. I haven't got a dime. I said, I'm going to do it anyway. My needs are met. My needs are met. My needs are met. My needs are met. Now, when the usher came by there, I got that envelope. And, and they passed out little, those little pencils, you know, about that long. You're supposed to fill out the envelope with. And I thought, well, now, wait a minute here. Now, look here. Now, whoa, here. I got a pencil. That's all I got. And I said, God, now, here's his word, not returning to me a voice. Now, whether you like it or not, he provided seed for me to sow. Oh, Brother Copeland, that's silly. You wait and we'll just see how silly. I said, God, that pencil right there is all I got. And I'm using that in the name of Jesus. I don't have the $10, but I got to become a partner. And I put $10 a month on that little envelope and stuck that pencil in there and prayed over it like it is good, you know. They gave it to me. It's my pencil. I could take it home if I wanted to, or I could put it in that envelope if I wanted to. I licked that dude and put it in the bucket. And stood there saying, My needs are met, my needs are met, my needs are met, my needs are met. In the name of Jesus, my needs are met according to His riches and glory. They closed the service. I start walking away, and there's a lady, oh, far and hit that door over there. Hey, wait a minute. You! Tra- yeah, you! She said, Hold on a minute. <laughs> She's uh, pushing her way through the people. Never saw that woman in my life. Come running over there to me. She said, Mister, I don't know who you are or where you're from. But God got all over me back there to bring you $10 and you was about to get out of here before I could give it to you. I said, Thank, give it here. And I, oh, I said, wait a minute, bring me. I got the, got the envelope, got my pencil, put it in my pocket and put that $10 in there and put it back in the, in the bucket. I may be crazy, but I became a partner and God started blessing me in that partnership. And He's still blessing me, praise God, because of my partnership with that ministry. 
I'm still reaping blessings off that. Hallelujah. Are you listening to me? His Word provided seed for the sower. Now listen. Don't eat your seed. You want me to tell you how to never ever go broke? Never again the longest day you live? Impossible for you to go broke. Don't ever spend your last $10 bill. Give it away. Give it away. Because that will get you $1,000. Amen? Then you tithe off that 1000 And that $100 will get you 10000 And you tithe off that 10000 Hmm? Don't ever eat your seed. Dumbest thing you can do is eat your seed. You ought to watch it work sometime. Find some fellow that's in deep need. Give him a hundred dollars and tell him, now don't spend a dime of it. Give it all away. <laughs> oh, you know. He's like the poor guy crawling across the desert and comes up on a well and there's a quart jar full of water there that says, don't drink the water, stupid. Prime the pump. You drink that water, you're going to kill everybody that comes along here after you. But if you'll prime the pump, you can get all you want to drink and refill the jar for the guy that's coming along after you. That's the way God's system works. And He said it'll provide seed for the sower and bread for the eater. He'll let you eat out of it. It's your patch. It's your garden. You can eat out of it. But don't ever eat your seed. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this up with something Jesus wanted me to show you. There's a lot of people, bless their hearts. Well, Brother Copeland, now tithing is under the law. Mm-mm-mm. They were tithing hundreds of years before there ever was a law. Abraham tithed the 400 years before Moses ever got the law. Tithing is a godly operation, not a priestly operation of men. It's a godly operation. It is of God. Turn to the book of Hebrews. That's in the New Testament, isn't it? Chapter 7, verse 8. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. That's Jesus. Jesus is the high priest of our tithe. You don't tithe with money. Now, quit dreaming and quit looking around and listen to me because I'm going to say something that will reshape your life. You don't tithe... With money, money is the tithe. Tithing is done with the mouth. In the 26th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, the Word of God said, Bring the tithe into the store's house and say before the Lord. And when you have ceased tithing... Are you hearing me? When you have stopped tithing. You didn't tithe when you just brought the money. The money is the tithe. You don't tithe with the money. The money is the tithe. You put it where it belongs. Your tithing is done with the mouth. And that's what God's people have refused to do. Why, brother, you're not going to catch me sitting there saying to God, to telling God to bless me. You can't buy the blessings of God. Well, no, you can't buy the blessings of God, but you can certainly obey God. And he said, say before the Lord, and tells you exactly what to say when you tithe. In the 26th chapter of Deuteronomy, he says, take it before the priest that shall be in those days, and say unto him, I was lost and undone, but I cried to your name, and you heard me and delivered me. And then he said, say unto the Lord, I have avouched you as our God, now you avouch us as your people, and look down from your holy habitation heaven and bless your people in a land that flows with milk and honey. That's tithing. And the people have all said, I wouldn't dare do a thing like that. And God says, okay, there's a curse on you. 
Tithing is done with the mouth. And when a person tithes, it's when he goes to God and says, Jesus, you're the high priest of my tithe. You said in your word to prove you with this. Your word is accomplishing in me what, in prospering in me what you called it to do. And I know it's not going to return unto you, boy. But it's returning to you right now. I'm saying it to you, Jesus. Your word says in the 26th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy that you will take my tithe and you will go before the heavenly Father and you will worship Him there with it and you will set it down before Him in a basket. And you said in there that I'm to say this unto you, so I'm going to say it to you. I was lost and I was undone. But I cried and you heard my cry. Oh, and you delivered me out of the authority of darkness and translated me into the kingdom of your dear Son. And here I am now in the land of promise. Oh, glory to God, the kingdom of God. I have planted of my seed, and here's the first fruit of my harvest. And so I bring it before you, Jesus. And so to complete my tithing, I say before you, according to what you said in Deuteronomy chapter 26, look down from your holy habitation, heaven, and bless me, your people. Bless me, your man. Cause my land to flow with milk and honey. Your word says in the book of Malachi, one of the privileges of the tither, sir, is that my crop will not fall in the field before it's time. Planting and harvesting. It's in everything of the kingdom of God. You also said in your word, Lord, the privilege of the tither was that you would rebuke the devourer for my sake. So get him. Would the God of heaven and earth not do what's right? I wouldn't talk to God like that. Well, your old crop won't come up. I'm not talking to him like that trying to boss him. I'm talking to him like that out of obedience. That's what he said to say. Charles Caps had an old rice crop that had rotted in the field. Had so much rain, it, 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 it just rotted in the field. Wasn't any good. He'd go out there and dig it up. No seeds are rotten and dead and gone. And he started to plow it up, and he thought, you know, I ought to practice what I preach. Now, there's one little old, little, old, little old one-lane road between his place and another guy's farm right there. I mean, and they all look just alike. He got out there and walked around his farm and said, Rice, I'm talking to you in the name of Jesus. Jesus said, Say unto the mountain, and I'm talking to you now. Now, you grow. I'm speaking life unto you. And then he said, Now, Jesus... You're the high priest of my tithe, and I'm a tither. i got the records to prove it. And in your name, I'm declaring in this field that my crop will not fall rotten in the field before it's time. You said you'd rebuke the devourer for my sake, and I'm a tither. And in Jesus' name, I consider him rebuked. Satan, in the name of Almighty God, his Son, whom I serve, get out of my rice field. Now, he had an excellent rice crop, and the guy right next to him plowed his up. Had an excellent rice crop. Another friend, preacher of mine, was up, in a, uh, up, up on the plains. There was, there was a guy up there who had a cotton crop. Strong believer. And he said, Tommy, doesn't the Word of God say that a tither's crop ought not fall in the field? He said, yeah. He said, get your Bible and let's go to field. They went out there, and Tommy told me, he said, after I got out there, I wish I'd have kept my mouth shut. He said, that old cotton crop was gone. (laughs) He said, man, it was ruined. Old mold had rotted in the field. There'd been too much water, you know. You know how they do. Man, it just all turned yellow and wasn't worth the price it'd take to plow it under. But he said, I got my Bible and stood out there, and he said, now, God, you told me right here, and you told this man here, and this man's crop is laying out here in this field worthless, and he's got bills to pay. And you said you'd meet his needs according to your riches and glory. Now, God hears your word. Don't you remember he said his word is the, makes the sower, gives the seed for the sower, and bread for the eater, and will not return void. And he read it out loud, standing out there in that cotton field. Lord, now you said it right here in this Word to bring the tithe into the storehouse. 
and you would rebuke the devourer for his sake, and that you would open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that he'll not be able to, to maintain and hold. But he said right here, you said his crop will not fall in the field before its time. He shall not destroy the fruit of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. You said it. Would the God of heaven do wrong? Would the God of heaven leave this field here unattended? Would the God of the tithe leave it undone? He said, all of a sudden, it sounded like a popcorn machine going off out there. Pop, 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 pop. Those cotton bowls are popping open. They popped all over several hundred acres of cotton, and they pulled in over a bale to the acre. Right? He said, they was jumping up and down and screaming and running around that pickup while the cotton bowls are bursting open standing out there in that pasture. But now, people... I'm telling you something right now. This is not Mickey Mouse Christianity. Well, what am I going to do, Brother Colton? I'm standing out there in that field talking ugly to God. No, you're not. You're being obedient to God. That's what God's wanted all the time. He's wanted sons and daughters, not puppets. You don't do this presumptuously. You don't do this with a bad attitude. You're not out there chewing God out. You're out there in obedience to God. But he said, come boldly to the throne of grace. I'm talking to Jack Hayford in Los Angeles the other day. And he, he was, he, we were discussing something. He just finished a book about it on prayer. Stepping out into impossibilities in prayer. How about the boldness of a believer. The boldness in prayer that moves the God of heaven. Hallelujah. And what boldness means to God. Oh, dear God. How'd you like to have a child that just always snuck in the back door? Never would deal with you face to face. Every time you walked in the door, he'd run hide in the bathroom. And every time you said anything, he'd fall on the floor and go squalling, bawling, kicking the chairs, groaning and moaning, and all the other kind of strange noises. Well, that'd be all right, you know, until he's 40, 50 years old. Then you'd finally think, well, you know, he's going to get over the whining stage someday. Huh? You remember when your child went through the whining stage where they just thought it was him? How would you like for him to stay that way all of his life? It comes a time when your child comes in, particularly if he's in business with you. You know, I mean, big old boy, you turn the whole unit over there over to him, turn that whole part of the business over to him, and he comes in there and goes, Daddy, I just don't know what to do over there. Ah, Lord, I've turned the business over to an imbecile. An idiot. You expect him to come over there and say, Dad, I want to talk to you a minute about that business over there. Now, the contract that you and I signed, you told me that you were going to send so many men over there to work in that place. And I wanted to remind you of it. I know what my daddy would say. When do you want them? I'd say, in the morning. He'd say, bless God, they'll be there. <laughs> why? Because he's an honest man. That's why he said he'd do it, he'd do it. It'd be ridiculous for he and I to go into a contract together and me go in there later and tell him, well, that's what the contract said. And he said, well, I'm not going to do that. Not my will to do that. It wasn't his will to do that. He ought not sign the contract. He can read. God's Word is his will. That is his will. He didn't say one thing and will another. And when he said, come boldly, that's exactly what he meant. And you ought to do it sometime and see what happens. You may be standing there with your knees shaking, but just straighten up and be bold anyway. Act like a grown person with God. Oh, there are times you get so emotional with Him, a little like you do anybody that you love. But your emotions are not a yardstick in this thing. Brother, we've got business to take care of in the name of God in these last days. Hallelujah. It's time that it's done well. Like Moses. Oh, dear Lord. And this was a man that was not naturally that way. He was a very meek man. 
He didn't even want to go talk to that Pharaoh because he stuttered and, he'd, and, and he, he, he didn't want to go talk to him at all. And Aaron had to go do the talking for him. But brother, when he got up face to face with God up on that mountain, he didn't stutter. And he got up right in God's face and God said, let me alone. I'm going to destroy that whole bunch and start over with you. He said, no, you're not. He said, you remember your covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're not bringing this people out into the middle of this desert to destroy them and have the whole world look at you and say, you're a God that can't deliver them. And the Bible said, God repented. And said, all right, I'll do it your way. <laughs> Abraham went before God and said, no, you won't destroy that city over there if there's 50 righteous in it. God said, no, I won't. He said, how about 40? <laughs> no, he said, I won't. He said, 30. First Jew job we've got in record. <laughs> Jude God down to 10. And God went right along with him. God went right along with him. But what I wanted you to see was this. God said, I'm not going to go destroy Sodom and Gomorrah without first going talking to my servant Abraham about it. God's not going to do anything in your family without coming talking to you about it. He wants to know what you think about it. You ought to go talk to Him and tell Him what you think about it. And His Word won't return to Him void. Be filled with power. Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah to Jesus. I had the Lord tell me one time over a situation. No, He said, I'm not going to do that. I said, yeah, you are now. I want you to do it. He said, no, I don't want to do that now. He said, that's out of line with what I want to do. I said, well, I'm asking you to do it anyway. I was wrong. And he said, all right, I'll do it anyway, but it's going to set your ministry back five years. And he said, it might set it back to a place it'll never get over. But he said, if you keep pushing me, I'll do it. No, no, I said, uh-uh, no, I ain't going to do it. <laughs> no, I said, you know best. I don't know what's the matter with me anyway, standing there shooting my mouth over that off. I, I'm not going to do it. But you know, he'd have done it. Why? Because I wanted him to. That's why. Oh, now, brother, I never heard nothing like that in my life. Well, that's what you get for not reading your Bible. Israel went to God and said, we want a king. We want to be like everybody else. He said, no, I don't want you to have a king. He said, I want to judge you. Yeah, we want a king. He said, if I give you a king, it'll ruin you. We don't care. We want a king. He said, all right, I'll give you a king. And it ruined them. <laughs> and Samuel said, well, they ought not have one. God said, I know it. And Samuel said, well, I know they ought not have it. And you know they ought not have it, but they want it. God said, well, go anoint one then. Isn't that amazing how far off religion has been in that area? His word will not return to him void. And if you'll be bold about it, your crop will come up. But now if you're going to be bold to God, you're going to have to be ready when he's bold with you. Because he's going to bless you and thrill you. And you're going to be driving down the street one of these days in your new car that God gave you when you were so bold. And he's going to say, call that preacher over there in Dallas and give him that car. <laughs> oh, your bonus just goes, whoo. <laughs> yeah, call him and give it to him. You dedicated the thing to me, didn't you? Yes, sir. <laughs> give it to him. Why? He wants you to get the hundredfold return on it. That's seed you're driving around in. Our God may want you to have three or four cars. Who knows? Why? Well, there may be that many preachers in town need to drive them. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Oh, brother, I wouldn't want to be extravagant. God is. He's not wasteful. But He is extravagant. I mean, brother, <laughs> when you're making... 200 feet tall gates out of one pearl, you are extravagant. <laughs> the foundation to the walls made out of diamonds and jasper. 
the real. And you know who He built all that for? You. You and me. Prepare the place for me where there are many mansions. You're not going to catch me singing just a little log cabin over in glory. <laughs> That's a lie anyway. Ain't nobody wants a log cabin here and glory at glory either one. Unless you just want it to play with <laughs> out behind the mansion. Stand up on your feet and we'll praise God. 